a little beat, it's not for you, that's for me to get in the groove. Uh, it just kind of sets the tone, gets us, as, as, as a pastor, just ready and encouraged to like look way back there where y'all are sitting and uh, get ready to preach this morning. So uh, thank y'all for being here this morning. I, I want to ask you a question. You feel successful? You feel like you've accomplished something in your life, that you've, you've achieved something that you've arrived don't actually stand up, but if I were to ask you to stand up, would you, would you stand up and say, yeah, I, I feel like I'm pretty successful. I've, I've achieved. I've, I've arrived. Let's, let's just fast forward to just the last 24 hours. Less than. Last night when we all went to bed, I don't, I don't know about you. I don't know what's going on with your day yesterday, but for me, I went to bed last night pretty good about my day. I felt pretty successful processing with my wife and, and just I was able to close my eyes thinking, man, great day. Today was a good day. Wake up this morning, different story. Because we have two kids. And I'm kind of like a third kid, and most dads are, right? And Sunday rolls around. It's like pulling teeth. It's like being in a UFC match. You never thought that a two-and-a-half-year-old could, could hurt you. They can. Uh, if I've learned anything in life, it's that a two-and-a-half-year-old girl can really offend my spirit and hurt me physically. Uh, and it happens a lot of mornings. And I don't feel as successful arriving here this morning as I did when I woke up this morning. Um, and honestly, if I'm being super honest, I, I really didn't wake up successful because I woke up to a two and a half year old's foot in my rib cage. So um, if you're anything like me, there's days we end our day, we feel good and we wake up and it's chaos, right? And, and we don't feel as successful as we maybe think that we should be. And this morning, I want to challenge us. Before you get your boxing gloves on and, and, and you put up a defense with the word success, I understand that's, that's a big word. And sometimes that's a little, uh, it's a little scary, um, especially if, if you find yourself and you you are successful in, in the eyes of the community. You, you might want to put your boxing gloves. I'm not asking for your money today, okay? So when you hear success and you think money that I'm going to be asking, I, I am not asking you for any of, of your money. So we can all lower that uh, pretty quickly. But I do want to ask you something. I want to challenge you with something. And my challenge this morning is that we would, as we look at this text, as we look at the word I want to challenge your philosophy of success. And I want to ask you to, however you currently define or believe success to be, I hope that you will allow that to be sat down for a moment and walk with me through this and allow all of us to be challenged and maybe realize we might have the wrong perspective of success. Solomon says it pretty good. I, I really like how he defines it in Proverbs 27. He says, a hot furnace tests silver and gold, but people, people, they're tested by praise they receive. What, he, what he's saying is, when your friends say, man, hey, great job, or after the first service, I, I'm grateful for the encouragement. Dude, you did a great job, man, but man, it is difficult, right? Whenever we're congratulated, when we hit an achievement at work, and we get praised, and we get exalted, how we handle that will tell us how successful we really are. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 4, and I believe it's a story about Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, and, and, and he challenges all of us. I believe that we are going to be challenged with this idea that, myself included, we might just have the wrong perspective of what success really is. If you don't know much about this King Nebuchadnezzar, at a very young age, he was a general in his dad's army. And, and he goes to war and defeats the Assyrians, which who at the moment were the most powerful empire in that time. And he single-handedly defeats the Assyrians. When his dad dies, he becomes the emperor of Babylon. And he continues to work and is continually successful. And he 
builds and expands the Babylonian Empire to become the most powerful empire in the world. Now, we're talking about King Nebuchadnezzar, so I'm going to be saying his name a lot. I don't do great with words. Uh, and I also believe that the Bible has to come to life for me, especially when I read the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes I struggle to read, and I, and I, and I get in a text, and I think, man, this doesn't, this just doesn't seem real. Like, this happened so long ago. Uh, so, so I got a, a decent imagination, but I have to use it to make it interesting. And, and so I give people nicknames, and I change some names sometimes. And honestly, just for this morning, it's going to be easier for me to talk through it if I shorten his name. So we're going to talk about King Neb this morning. That's going to be his nickname. And Neb's got some pride, right? He, he's had some success in his life. And, 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 and Neb's got some arrogance. He's got an ego surrounding all this success that he's, that he's achieved. He's, as he gets older, he begins to have some, some crazy, crazy dreams. Very disturbing dreams in his life. We've, we've read about one of them a couple weeks ago. And, and uh, he doesn't know how to interpret them, which to me doesn't make sense because if you're the most powerful, most influential man, the richest guy, you, you have everything you ever want, why can't you tell me what your own dream means, right? But he can't. So he has to have help. And he calls somebody 30 years ago, and they had to help him interpret a dream. Now, I don't know how Neb knows who to call because he went around in the 80s. Now, I wasn't either, but I, I know who to call. Dun -dun 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 -dun. There it is, right? When there's something strange in your neighborhood, who you going to call? There you go. Come on. And there's something weird and it don't look good, who you going to call? All right, we're going to do that again. If there's something strange in your neighborhood, who you going to call? Come on. If there's something weird and it don't look good, who you going to call? Ghostbusters, right? That's not who King Nebuchadnezzar calls because he didn't get to see that incredible film and, and, and live in that time. I got to as a throwback, right? That's why I'm wearing a bomber jacket today because I'm trying to throw it back a little bit. But he calls the only person he knows can interpret his dream, which is Daniel, the same guy who interpreted his last dream. 30 years later, he calls the same guy. This crazy dream. If you want to read the dream itself and, 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 and what he saw, it's the first part of chapter 4. We're going to skip the actual dream. We're going to jump for time's sake to Daniel telling Nebuchadnezzar what his dream means. And what this tree that gets chopped down and crazy things happen, what does it mean for King Neb? Here's what Daniel tells him. Your dream is God telling you he's tired of it. He's fed up with your arrogance. He's exhausted with your pride and your ego. Look, man, everything you have, everything you've built, everything you've achieved is because God's allowed you to be there. Yeah, you did the work, but he let you. He allowed you to have that success. And you're taking the credit for yourself. And he's exhausted. He's tired with that. He, he, he's not, time's up, bud. Time is up. You haven't humbled yourself. You don't want to humble yourself. So he's going to remove you from power. And in your dream, this tree gets cut down. It's you being removed from the greatest position in the known world. And for a season, you're going to go to the desert and you're going to live like an animal. Your hair is going to grow long. It's going to get matted. Your fingernails are going to grow out like a bird, it says. And he's going to go absolutely insane. Literally does not comprehend his own understanding. And so that's where we're going to kind of look at this morning. And Daniel interprets King Neb's dream. And we start in verse 29, if you would stand with me as we read the word of God. This is what it says. Twelve months later, as King was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said... Is it not this great Babylon I have built as a royal residence? By my mighty power and the glory of my majesty. Does sound any, any, uh, listen to this yet? Okay. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass you. For you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. 
immediately what has been said Nebuchadnezzar, about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from his people. He ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Just pray with me this morning. God, may I step into your authority this morning. God, would you speak through me? Would you continue to teach me in my life about my success and how I put myself before you? God, would you speak to your people this morning? God, would they have ears to hear your word and your truth and what you had to tell us about defining success? Amen. You can have a seat. Thank you for standing with me. Daniel interprets his dream, and everything he interprets happens to King Neb. But he forgets. He doesn't follow through, right? He, he, he does not listen. He doesn't follow through. He hears it, but he forgets. Don't we forget sometimes? We hear things and we forget. It's like having a new job. I remember the first job out of college. Man, it was, I was so excited. Maybe you've had that first job experience and it just kind of is, eh. But then you get a new job. You get a promotion. You move cities. It's a little scary, but it's, it's good. You got a promotion. You're making more. New coworkers. It's just like right out of college. It's this fresh experience. And then you wake up six months and think, man, I, I hate this job just as much as the last one. I'm not growing this ladder. I'm not going as fast as the guy that hired me said I would. Look at our typical marriage, right? We get, we get engaged and we start planning a wedding, picking out dress colors, and the guys are talking about what kind of shoes they're going to wear because that's now the cool thing. Like, you wear, like, a three-piece suit, but then you wear Converse, which is strange to me, but, right? We're excited, though, right? There's a lot of news. A lot of things are happening. And we get married. It's a beautiful ceremony. Outside, fall leaves are falling, right? We go on a honeymoon. It's a blast. And then we wake up and we've been married for three years. First kids on the way and you think, man, why don't, why don't I pursue my wife the way that I used to? Where, where, did, where did the intimacy go? Why isn't it as fun as it was when we were engaged? Because the newness is worn off and, and life is happening around us. And we forget we get new toys, right? We get a new car. Oh, man, y'all know the smell of a new car. Brand new. You drive it off the lot. Just leather. Mm, I don't know that smell. I've never owned a brand new car. Uh, cars I buy are new to me. And they don't smell like fresh leather. They smell like a kid's already been in it. And then I put two kids in it. So if you know the fresh smell of a new car, let me know. Man, I, I dream of it. I've never experienced that. Because the cars I have, the newness has already worn off. Right? Think of us as, as believers. Gosh, as a pastor, one of the coolest things that I get to watch and happen is people build relationships with their friends. And, and, and they come in, and ask for advice, and, and, and they go share the truth with their coworker or their friend. And that friend gives their life away to Jesus. And they cry out to the Lord to rescue them. And they build a relationship with him. And they're like reading their Bible and stuff. And they're going to church, and they're telling their friends. And they go to the waters of baptism. And people stand up and cheer. But one of the greatest moments in my life was whenever a crowd of people at my home church, when I was eight or nine years old, come through the waters, right? I can't hear anything. It's like you swim, but you come up, and all you can hear is this eruption of cheer and joy and celebration. What an incredible moment. And then a year and a half goes by and you're like, man, I haven't been to church in a minute. In fact, I'm not sure if I can even locate my Bible. I've got coworkers that kind of say, hey, you should come to church with me, but it's like, eh, yeah, I did that, right? What happens? How many times do we look just like King Neb right here? We've seen God work. We see him do incredible things in our life, but then we just forget. Crazy stuff. How, 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 do, we, how do we get over that high? How do we miss that? When I observe this text, I look, I look at his life and the mistakes that he makes, and, and I, I believe that we can learn some mistakes from, from King Neb's life. 
And, and if, if we'll listen, if we'll observe his life, we can avoid the pitfalls that he failed to see. So this morning, if you're taking notes, I want us to look at some dangers of having the wrong perspective of success. And when we define success incorrectly, the first thing that happens is we get short-sighted. We fail to see. We get comfortable. We get complacent in our success. Daniel 4, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was enjoying a time of peace and prosperity. He says, I didn't have a care in the world. There ever been that moment? The last time I had that moment was on our honeymoon when my phone was locked up and I was at an all-inclusive, right? I, I feel like that's just not something you get to experience anymore after all that and the world starts happening. But every once in a while, there's that moment that you're like, man, I don't know what I'm going to do today. I ain't got nothing going on. Kids are at the grandparents' house. I can do anything I want. You ever had that moment in your life? If you've had that moment, somebody better take me fishing when I'm in that moment. Man, I, I, that's what I do. When life's good, I go fishing. I like to hunt. I like to fish. I like to be outside. I'd rather, I'd rather be changing or learning how to change oil in a car and do something dirty with my hands. I, I just enjoy that. Now, you might be a little confused. Because I, I, I'm wearing a bomber jacket and I'm rocking a gnarly mustache, a little throwing a little, try to be hipster about it. It's, I don't know if I'm making it or not, but y'all hating on it, so I'm just going to keep rocking it. So you might look at that and be like, I'm so confused. How's this kid wearing shoes that are never going to see dirt on them ever in their life, but he says he likes to go fishing? I, 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 I'm confused too, but all I know is I grew up in Oklahoma and I have, I have pictures and memories of me with fish taller than I was, right, pulling out 45 pounds, 65 pounds, flathead catfish, they were taller than I was. I didn't do it, but my uncles did with their hands, right? That is what I grew up with. I enjoy being outside. So if life is good, if you got a bass boat, call me, all right? Because I'm ready to go fishing. Things are great. We miss, we miss it. And we get short-sighted. And we fail to see the warning signs. That's our second danger this morning. We become short-sighted and then we miss the warning signs. We don't see it. And often in our lives, everything's going good. Everything is fine. And we're so fi fixated on like being and enjoying and doing that we miss what God is trying to warn us about. This is our daughter Hattie, she's two and a half years old. Uh, not the greatest photo, right? This is after school. She's got dirt all over her shirt. And, but which I love because, I mean, she had a great day, right? And it looks like I fed her dinner that night. But um, so every morning, though, uh, we, I make breakfast, okay? And don't think like, oh, man, what a spectacular husband. He makes breakfast for his whole family every morning. I, I make scrambled eggs, okay? Every once in a while, I'll throw some bacon on. Like, I'm not making eggs benedict, nothing crazy. All right, we don't even own a waffle iron, okay? I just... Skillet, crack some eggs, and breakfast. And Hattie thinks that I'm the greatest. So for now, that's what we're going to roll with. But she likes, she likes to learn. She likes to cook. And, and she likes to help. So we've got her Minnie Mouse stuff, that, her little spatula. And what she's learned, this is where I failed as a parent. Uh, because I've kind of started teaching some bad habits. And it's irreversible at this point. Uh, because now, anytime she's in the kitchen, she's no longer sitting on a bar stool at a counter eating like a normal child. She's pushing the stool around the corner and climbing up onto our countertop because she wants to stir the eggs. Which is fine because I, I enjoy the teachable spirit, but when eggs are done cooking, you plate them, right? Take the skill off the stove, grab the plate out of the pantry, and as you're plating eggs, your two-year-old is trying to help, and to do so, she walks across your stove. I'm... The best dad in the world, right? Um, so if you didn't catch it, right, this isn't the same moment. This is, I clearly haven't learned my lesson because this is not even the same moment that it happened. But if you, if you check it out, we've missed a warning sign here. One, blatantly, glowing hot stove, okay? If we don't see that, they give you this little bitty dot in the corner, a little fuzzy, but it says hot surface. And when that little light's glowing, if you've missed the big red one, they give you a little bit of orange one that says, hey, don't put your kids on this yet. You know what I mean? And uh, I mm, probably shouldn't put them on there ever, and I failed. We got to experience blisters and Band-Aids, 
And now we have an infatuation with Band-Aids, and we put Band-Aids on things that aren't even hurt. So uh, that's where my next paycheck goes, is to Band-Aids. My point here, we're not, we're, not any, we're not any better than she is. There are hot surface warnings all over our life, and we ignore them all the time. Oftentimes, we don't see them. But if we will listen, right, if, if we'll open our eyes and we'll observe the things around us and listen and, and, and hear and learn from these warning signs, we can avoid the failure in our life. And God clearly warned Nebuchadnezzar. He cared enough to warn him. Right? God, God wants him to be warned. He's not just watching him build himself up and never give God back everything that he deserves and then just one day wakes up and is like, I'm tired of it, and zaps him dead, right? No. He gives him ample opportunity. He gives him a dream. He provides somebody who knows the dream and interprets the dream for him. Daniel says, nah. I mean, King Neb says, nah. But Daniel says, but if you'll listen, if you'll humble yourself, if you will do what he's asking, you will avoid this embarrassing experience that's about to happen to you. But he doesn't listen. And oftentimes, we also fail to miss those warning signs. What, what, are, what are they, right? My, my question is, what are these signs that we miss? Where do we look for them? What do they look like? What do I need to be seeing in my life that might be a warning? For taking notes, here's a few that I would like to share with you that I've experienced in my life. Now, there are, uh, there are warning signs all over the place. There's not just three, all right? So don't just write down three and be like, oh, that's easy, that's enough, right? There are warning signs everywhere. But here are the ones that I've unfortunately learned because I've missed them. Conflict. In every relationship, across the board, friends, family, marriage, when you fail to communicate correctly, there's going to be conflict. And you're going to see it because there's, there's tension in a relationship. There's tension between you and the wife. And when there's tension and there's conflict, maybe, just maybe, there's a warning sign here, hey, we're not reading the same book here, right? What we have here is a failure to communicate, right? Let conflict be a sign that says, man, maybe I'm not understanding correctly. Another warning sign that, that I, I've learned is chaos and confusion. You know when, when things are, we say this all the time, when things, when things slow down, when things aren't so busy, I'll go do these when life slows down a little bit, when it's not so crazy and chaotic, I'll go be a part of fill in the blank. When we live our life understanding and believing that life's going to slow down, we miss a warning sign. When we chalk life up to life's just busy. No, life's not just busy. We have failed to walk through confusion and chaos looking to the one who walks through it with us. We don't serve a God of confusion. My God's not a God of chaos. He knows exactly what he wants done. But I've ignored the warning sign of me putting too many things in front of him that I just say, ah, life's busy. No, you're busy and you're making yourself busy. I've made myself busy. God's not moving. So when life's crazy and life's confusing and it's chaotic, we've missed the sign. My wife, she gets confused a lot. Um, she gets overwhelmed a lot. Uh, and if you know Michaela, you understand why she gets so confused. Uh, if you're a first-time guest with us today, thanks for being here. You've probably already met her. Because she likes to talk a lot. In fact, she likes to talk before I'm done talking. And uh, that's where our confusion comes in a lot. And a lot of times, our conversations 
are, are everything that I didn't want them to be. In fact, it, a lot of times it goes like this. Hey, I was thinking we should go, oh, yeah, yes, I need to go to Target. I need decorations for Christmas. I need new bed sheets. We need a new lampshade because Helen pushed it over yesterday. I've got a whole grocery list. Target, great idea. Not what I was going to say. <laughs> My thought was, hey, I think we should go get the oil changed because it's like a thousand miles overdue in your escape. Oh, I thought we could go to Target. <laughs> well, if uh, you would listen and let me finish, you wouldn't be so disappointed right now. Can we understand that? Don't raise your hand, just kidding. Don't raise your hand. Um, but man, do we not do that with God all the time? Do we not listen to him for a little bit and think, oh, yeah, God, oh, that's great. Great idea, God. I'm going to go do that. And he says, no, 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 no. Uh, let me finish. You know, my thought is if, if we can't even let our spouse finish, there's no way in the world we're letting God finish. And when we don't let God finish telling us what he wants us to do, Life's going to get really confusing and chaotic. Don't miss that sign. Here's another one. Temptation. And, and this is, you're going to turn your ears on for a minute to understand me here. Temptation is a warning sign. Okay. Temptation, being tempted, right? the enemy says, hey, do something wrong, right? That's an invitation to do something wrong. That's an invitation from the enemy to sin. Being tempted is not a sin. Okay? When you have something in your life that you're tempted by and you want to do it, but you know that it's not right, you're not wrong in that moment. But if we don't change our perspective and stop viewing it as an invitation and start viewing it as red lights turning and blaring and sirens going off saying, stop. Do not go over there. If we don't change our perspective and see temptation as a warning sign, what are we going to do? We're going to open an invitation. And we're going to take a little baby step. And we're, we're going to kind of listen just for a minute. Just for a minute. It's just a conversation about work. It was after, it was after 8 o'clock, I understand that. But it was, just, it was, it was about work. We went to lunch, but yeah, we talked about life, but we were talking, it was some year and a half later, wake up, there's no intimacy in your marriage because you've been having an affair for a year because we opened invitation to sin. And a lot of times we played sports in, in, in high school and in college maybe or wherever it may be for you and, and now you've got kids. They're not phenomenal at sports, but they're decent, so you put them in AAU ball, right? You coach them. You, you push them a little too hard. You wake up and your kid's playing D1 basketball. Your, your, your daughter's playing D1 volleyball, but they hate their life because you push them and miss the morning signs and we're living so vicariously through your kids because you were tempted to live out your glory days through your family. God warns Nebuchadnezzar. He says, you're going to lose everything, buddy. You're going to lose everything. I, I'm glad that you're successful. I, I, it's great to watch you succeed. But if you don't change your perspective, you don't change your attitude and, and, and return the things that are mine to me and start blessing other people around you because of what I've allowed you to have, you are going to fail. We get short-sighted. We ignore the warning signs. The third danger of defining success incorrectly is when we delay obedience, we are disobedient. Right? When we delay our obedience, we are disobedient. We put off obeying because we procrastinate. We, we, we get postponed. We delay it. Why? We're scared. We're scared of what might just happen. A coworker might jump the ladder faster than I can. 
We're weak. We get lazy. What's Daniel 4, 29? It says, 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, 12 months. What was this joker doing? I don't, was, it, was it not clear enough? Did you have to go back and study it or something? He said, if you don't listen, if you don't change your perspective, if you don't change what you're doing, you will fail. Who takes 12 months to be like, oh, that's what he was saying. I'll tell you what he was doing. He was procrastinating. He was delaying. He was ignoring. In fact, he goes back to do the exact same thing he was doing 30 years ago. He went back to what was comfortable. He went back to being in control of his own life. And he experienced a major CEO burnout. What I mean by CEO burnout, right, we've all seen it on the news. When, when an executive of a company fails, loses touch with reality, who gets to see it? Everybody. It's public. It's humiliating. It's all over the news. In fact, here's, here's Joaquin Phoenix. This is him. Uh, I love Johnny Cash. And Joaquin plays him in, John, in, in Walk the Line. This is, this is his most recent adventure. Right? If you've, if you've seen Joker, obviously I get this joke because he's acting here. He's acting here. He's just an actor. Let me, let's go to something more real that the public's definitely seen. This is my friend Brittany. Mm. This is her whenever I would never tell you that I liked her music, like in middle school. Okay? But I did. put it on my Walkman. Everybody did. No judgment. I don't listen to it anymore because she's crazy. Right? She literally shaved her head. Um, if, you're not, if you're not certain of what to think about Britney, she's, she's still absolutely crazy. Okay? Um, another person that I, that I feel like we should all remember uh, is Parent Trap and uh, Lindsay Lohan. Some of you may know the first Parent Trap. This is the Parent Trap I know. Um, but uh, she turned out great. I mean, she, her success, she, she knew exactly what to do. She found the best barber in town, said, uh, let's go blonde. And uh, uh, success goes to our head. You know what I mean? Like, when you're seeing someone succeed, you, you understand what happens here. This is exactly what happens to King Nebuchadnezzar. He goes crazy. He loses touch with reality. The favorite part of this whole story doesn't have to end here. We don't have to end up there. King Nebuchadnezzar has an opportunity to change. There's a song we sing on Wednesday nights. We sing it last Wednesday. We sing it every once in a while with our students. It's called The Heart of God. And I, I think about King Neb and his failure and, and how, how when we ignore our warning signs, when we get short-sighted and start realizing that, that God didn't want to leave him there. God doesn't want to leave us where we are. And in this song, it's, it's, it talks about God's mercies and it talks about his kindness. God has a, a mercy that triumphs over judgment. The song says that he has a kindness that leads us to repentance. Come on, church, that's good. God wants to save us. He wants a relationship. He loves a repentant heart. Check this out. Look what happens right here. God restores King Nebuchadnezzar's mind. He restores his mind. Verse 36, at the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and my splendor returned to me for the, for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out. I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Listen, I just remember the perspective that he had at first about his kingdom and his palace and everything he had. His perspective has changed. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all of his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. I feel like I could just walk off right here. In fact, I feel like King Neb could have done a better job of pinning this based on his experience. I feel like it would have been more truth to say those who walk in pride, he does humble. We get an opportunity to humble ourselves here, but if we don't, if we don't 
watch the restoration of Nebuchadnezzar. He will humble us in the end days. There's a process, though. He didn't just wake up one day and everything's given back to him. There, there's a process to this. And, and, and maybe you're thinking, okay, well, what is that process? Because I walked in here this morning right where he is in this moment. I didn't get an opportunity to hear this and say, oh, here, l- let me hear the warning signs. I've already ignored the warning signs. You're walking in here broken. You're walking in here thinking, man, I am in that desert. I have failed to see the warning signs. I've been short-sighted. I've been disobedient. So what do I do? That's a great question. One of the things I challenge our student ministry to do is to be honest. I'm 27. I, I don't know a lot. So I asked some friends, what do you do when you miss the warning signs? A friend of, I called, is really a mentor and a hero of mine since the moment that we got here at TBF, my, my family. And he's got a successful career. He's financially stable. I admire the way that he leads his family, the way that he loves his wife. He makes me a better pastor. He makes me a better friend. He makes me a better husband. He makes me a better leader. So I asked him, I said, have you ever stopped trusting Jesus because of the success that you've seen here? Has there been a time where you've been given so much that you, you stopped trusting Jesus with it? This is what he said. I don't always get it right. I'm not always there with my thoughts and my actions, but I know that God gives and God takes away whether I have a lot or little. He says, I will always, gosh, listen, I will always have more than I desire because, we sang about it this morning, because of the blood of Jesus who saves me from even my sinful self. Man. I called another friend from Florida. He's planting a church. And, um, who plants a church in the pandemic? And it's just crazy. And they're doing some awesome stuff. And their church is, is really successful in these early days. And I call them. I just want to encourage them, man. Like, it's really great to see the success y'all are having right now. He stopped me. He said, man, I don't, we, don't, we don't see this as a success because of results. Yes, God is blessing us. And we're seeing great things, but it is not because of the results. Success is not an achievement for us. Our success is not about an outcome. For us, it's about our obedience to the will of God. That is good. Both. One one friend, financially blessed, incredible opportunities. One, incredible gift of spiritual leadership probably broke trying to plant a church and feed a family of five right very different perspectives and here's why I share both of their comments because we're all between those two I don't care if you are successful in business and in leadership and and you have everything you would think you would dream to have if you're starting a brand new business and you're not really sure where funds are going to come from If you've been a believer for 40 years and you have an opportunity to lead churches, plant churches, lead organizations, and and lead peers to Christ, you're not afraid to stand on a stage and and, and preach, I don't care if you just became a believer yesterday and you don't know your answers. You don't know how to talk about your faith. Because what I believe in is a God who says, hey, I've given everything to all of you. And all I'm asking you to do is to be obedient what I've put in front of you. My hope, my prayer is that we would leave here understanding success is not about an outcome. It's not about an achievement. It's not about a position. It's not about a dollar amount in our account. But that we would see our success as obedience to the will of God and that we would honor Him, that we would praise Him, that we would give back what He's given us and allowed us to have no matter what that is.